we are in an informal age and we are playing formal music and we have to find the bridge from one to the next. We are also in an ever more racially diverse community and country and we must go across that bridge as well. <laughs> Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin. And with us today, we have Howard Herring, who serves as president and CEO of the New World Symphony. Welcome to the show, Howard. Great to be here, Aaron. Looking forward to a conversation. Absolutely. So uh, for those who, who might not be familiar, could you kind of just give the quick overview of the New World Symphony, especially how you're completely unique and unlike any other orchestra in the country. <laughs> yes, I can do that. Michael Tilson Thomas lived his early life as a wonderful young conductor and, and pianist and composer. And at a certain point, he imagined that there might be another way to go at the education of talented young players. And he had the good fortune of meeting Ted Arison, who was the founder of Carnival Corporation. Ted was an enormous music lover, would have been a pianist had he had the chance, and decided after spending a few hours with Michael that this was a really good idea and that it should be pursued. Michael's thought was that there's um, a middle ground between academic work and professional life that when you finish your formal academic work, you could then spend a little more time finding your own voice, beginning to imagine yourself in the larger world of music and society. And then over the course of that time, get uh, fully prepared to take the audition, which is the essential part of becoming an orchestral musician. So the New World Symphony was born around that idea that we would gather in the graduates of, of music schools from around the country, now around the world, and help them become leaders. Uh, that's what our mission statement says, is that we will help them become leaders. It's an interesting, there's a sort of a creative conflict inborn. Um, if you are a member of an orchestra, the, the maestro is the conductor and is causing things to happen from that center point, and yet leadership is th shot throughout an orchestral uh, ensemble. And to an ever greater extent throughout a community. So when we talk about leadership, we talk about excellence of playing, certainly, and also leadership within the section or within the orchestra, but we also talk about leadership in the community, how you understand the community, how you become ever more relevant, how you make the art form ever more relevant, and, more, and you become more personal in your connections. So what began as the pursuit of, of grand and glorious idea that we explore this middle ground is now 32 years later, the New World Symphony with 87 fellows and about 1150 alums who are spread across the world and many of them in leadership positions, either in their orchestras or in their ensembles or faculties or communities. Awesome, awesome. So, and I wanna talk a little more about that and some aspects of newer, especially technology and those types of things. Um, but before that, kind of for you personally, right? So you, you really started out as a pianist, right? So how, how kind of did you make that transition and, and how did you end up in this leadership role at New World? So I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma and I had a really wonderful, I had two wonderful teachers as a child. <clears throat> two wonderful teachers as a child and went off to Southern Methodist as an undergraduate and then on to Manhattan School of Music. While I was at Manhattan, uh, I met a violinist and a cellist and we formed a trio and we won what was then called Artists International. And the prize was a, a debut in Carnegie Recital Hall. We got a good review and, um, and we decided, let's, let's just do this. So we stayed together for six years and we played a lot of concerts, had a great time. Um, and then finally said, you know, this is probably not the future for us. So I, I wasn't done. I started a second ensemble. And then I started a festival. I went back to the little town I grew up in and I, I talked with several people who 
we're enthusiastic about bringing players back there in the summertime, short period of time, a way to play some concerts, but also work with young players in the community. And we, we launched. And after the first couple of years, we did it seat of the pants. We did it as we could. After the first couple of years, it was clear that the ticket sales that we could realize, the, the revenue from tickets, was not enough to finance this little operation. We were only two weeks long. We were a little festival, but we needed to get paid. I went to a friend of mine. He's actually a mentor. who He was a mentor to me throughout his life. And I said, you know, Charlie, I'm stuck. There's not enough money to make this happen. And he said, oh, we can fix that. He said, um, he said, we'll just raise the money. I asked him how that worked. He said, it's pretty simple. We're going to get the right people in the room and you're going to spin the dream and I'm going to explain their responsibilities. So it happened. We put 15 people in a room on a Sunday afternoon. I told him where I wanted to go. He explained what it was going to take financially to get there. And we walked out fully financed. Wow. After that meeting, I began to realize that my job was not to play the concerts. My job was to represent the art form. And the gap between the cost and the ticket revenue must be filled. So I've spent the rest of my life filling that gap. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, that's phenomenal. And you do it in an incredible way to an incredible level. Um, so kind of getting back to this leadership role that you've been able to, to have at New World, you know, in many ways, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, you know, I kind of see you having the ability to be the crystal ball for orchestras. You can experiment and kind of live the future that many other orchestras might live before they get there. And just wondering if, A, if, if I kind of have the right sense of that, and B, what are some of those things you see coming down the pike for orchestras? What are you kind of experimenting with or exploring doing at New World now that you think will really take hold for the field? Sure enough. So we do see ourselves as a laboratory. We think of ourselves as a laboratory for reimagining the way music is taught and presented and experienced. Um, that last word, perhaps the most important of the three. Um, as far as Looking into the future, when we articulated the plan for the New World Symphony, the plan that then drove the design and that drives us even today, we ask ourselves, where, where will we be in 2030 or 2040? And if that's where we will be, how does that relate to where we think the art form might be by then? Now, we had the good fortune of imagining the future in the early, early days of digital. By the time I arrived at New World in 2001, they had just received a grant from the NEA and the National Science Foundation in combination, $200,000 total, had outfitted the old Lincoln Theater with cameras and a projector, and we began to experiment. We began to try to figure out how sight and sound work together. We tried to understand what happens when you teach online. How is the information given and received, and what are the what, what's valuable and what is of less importance? Um, we've we were early on early in in that period we were actually working with music schools around the country in this way. The Manhattan School of Music and the Cleveland Institute both had online uh, capability, so we did a lot of experiment experimenting there also with the Royal Danish Academy. Um, that was the teaching side of it. On the presenting side, we, we relied on an early, early vision. Ted Arison, as he spoke with, with Michael in, in the days that they were planning the launch of the New Ultimity, he said, you know, maybe we put a television and some speakers up over the door of the lobby so, and just run one camera so people on the street can see what's going on inside. In fact, that's what they did. Um, tiny little speakers, right? All this, all this music coming through these two tiny little speakers. When I think about it, it's hilarious. Yet it was the start point for the idea that you could bring this music out, that you could turn the concert hall inside out and you could bring it to the larger public. I used to stand in front of the Lincoln Theater and talk to people because they would stop and look at the television screen and they'd hear the music. Oh, what is this? 
perfect question. Let me give you an answer. So this kind of community involvement and engagement was something that was at New World from the start. So how do we teach online? What works? What doesn't? How do we use digital to move beyond the concert hall? Now that tiny little television screen has turned into wall casts. 7,000 7, square feet, 4K projection, big time Meyer Constellation sound system, you know, the, the, the sonic envelope, all that. So that is in place. What's fascinating to us now, you ask about where the future is. What fascinates us, us now is can you build an online community? And if you can, what are the natural elements of that community? What, what drives people toward you and how do you satisfy them? How do you share this music? All of us are compelled to share this music. We are musicians and we want to push it out. We are outward facing in that way. And yet we don't know quite always how people are receiving it. There's a certain threat just to be in a concert hall for someone who's not acquainted with this music. So how do we get past those barriers? And little by little, we are in fact building an online community. If you take the wallcast as an example, it's at least 2000 people per wallcast. And those people are totally dedicated. They show up time after time after time and they can tell you why they love it. It's not just the music, it's the informality. It's a transformative experience in a communal setting. It's a chance to share a glass of wine, right? So all of those things are part of the future, we think. Having, having experienced that, I actually felt a sense of conflict because when I was there, I was like, wait a minute, I think I want to be outside experiencing the wall cast than inside in the actual concert. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a musician. Should I feel that way or not? So, the answer is yes, Aaron. Right. You're just fine. Go to the, go to the park. Right. So as you kind of uh, explore these, these new things and, and serve as, as a laboratory, um, do you feel anything that has kind of risen as the biggest challenge, the biggest obstacle, the biggest, you know, in building an online community and kind of going this route or expanding how, you know, we can bring our art form out to others? Do you find there's a singular or, or a kind of barrier obstacle that's rising uh, above others? There sure is. After every New World Symphony concert, some of the fellows go into the lobby and greet the audience. We've been doing this forever. As part of every New World performance, there is a video profile of one of the fellows. They tell their story. It's two minutes, two and a half minutes long. Short, but very powerful. So how you tell your story in those ways creates a deeper level of involvement between musician and audience member. Our audience members follow our guys. Oh my goodness, so and so's gone. Where did he? Where did he land? Where did she? Where did she go for? Uh, for an orchestra job? So all of that direct relationship can be built if you really just spend the right time, enough time at the right moment to engage with your audience. Much more difficult online. Yes, we we do a Facebook Live every Friday afternoon. Friday evening at seven o'clock. We call it live from our living room. And it was done in response to the, to the fact that all of our guys had to be only in their, in, their, uh, in their living quarters during this quarantine and now social distancing. What's interesting is that to watch the Facebook Live of these performances, you know, you get people hit the button, they show the heart, they show the thumbs up, they do those sorts of things. It's not connectivity. It's not dialogue. What we're asking is how do we get to dialogue? That means that the machines and the software have to accommodate that. They have to anticipate and accommodate. We haven't figured this out yet, but we are gonna go there. Awesome, awesome. So one uh, question, and I know unfortunately we're running even already a little short on time, but I always like to ask my guests kind of this three things question. If, as we look at the field, are there kind of three things, words, concepts, things that if either someone's, you know, aspiring musicians or aspiring leaders looking to kind of be informed for how they lead, are there three things that you say, you know, you should keep these things in mind. These will help you 
as kind of guideposts as you try and achieve or fulfill your goals? We are in an informal age and we are playing formal music and we have to find the bridge from one to the next. We are also in an ever more racially diverse community and country and we must go across that bridge as well. We're working hard at that at New World. Those, those are the first two things that come to mind. The third is that we, at New World, we talk about this a lot. You've got to constantly reinvent. You have to ask yourself that question. Wherever you are, there's a better place beyond. So don't get satisfied. Get brave. Always head toward reinvention. And if we do that, we will always be a step ahead, if you will, uh, more engaged, more, uh, more in touch with our communities, and that will then grow the audience and we'll all be better off. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, one last just quick question. You know, you're, you've been on lockdown just like your fellows and, and everyone. Uh, there's gotta be some frustrating, challenging moments where do you find your, your solace or your inspiration personally when, you know, things just surrounding us may seem like they're insurmountable? How do you find your own sense of inspiration? I listen. I listen to a lot of music when I can. Um, there are certain poets that I read. Um, the ones who are most enthusiastic about um, an inner flame or an understanding of who we are deep down. So I, I, I read a lot. I love the concentration of poetry and the fact that you can can take an enormous thought and squeeze it into four lines or eight lines or twenty four lines or whatever. Um, and I do my best to stay in touch with the people who are most important to me. It's not so much fun online. It's not so much fun on Zoom, but it's critical. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Awesome, awesome. Well, Howard Herring, you truly are one of the great arts engines in our field, powering human creativity. Thank you so much for taking the time with us here on the show. Thank you, Aaron. Take it easy. Hey.